לא רואה, אה, שם רואה? אפשר? Good morning or good afternoon uh, to all the participants in this webinar. My name is Dr. Yav Leiser. I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon from Israel. I finished my uh, dental uh, school at the Hadassah Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, I think it was 2004. Uh, finished my PhD in molecular biology also in 2004. And uh, my MD studies uh, finished in Tel Aviv University and my oral and maxillofacial training in uh, Haifa in uh, Ramba Medical Center. So I'm all over Israel and I know most of the country. So I thank you all for coming. The topic of my lecture is going to be the advanced techniques in alveolar ridge rehabilitation and complications. I'll try to give as much as possible all the techniques that I am aware of and I'm using, and I will show you cases of my own patients, and a little bit about complications. So a little bit about overview about all the basic techniques. We will talk about implantation rehabilitation, meaning barrier membrane for vertical as well as horizontal augmentations, ridge spreading, only bone grafting, extraction and immediate implantation with single tooth, and extraction and immediate implantation and immediate loading of total jaws. And after that, we're going to talk a little bit about common complications, because I think that if you're going to do any of these techniques, you should also learn how to deal with complications, since this is something that is really happening all the, all the time, and I will show you a little bit about the cases. So we'll talk about serious life-threatening infections, about bleeding, nerve injuries, and sinus lift failures. So the first thing I want to speak about is mastering basic techniques for dental implant rehabilitation. So any surgeon who wishes to start rehabilitation of alveolar ridges or total jaws needs to master these techniques. These techniques will arm you with the necessary tools to deal with any complication and resolve it. Barrier membrane, you all know, vertical, as well as horizontal. Vertical is less common, horizontal is more common. Guided bone regeneration is when you need to, to extract the tooth and then to use the membrane to guide it to the bone with or without a membrane, of course. Only bone grafting, this is the gold standard if you want to have a higher uh, vertically or horizontally. And ridge spreading, sometimes it is also important if you are going to do total jaws, you need to learn these techniques. And all of these techniques will help you to guide to total jaw rehabilitation. And I will try to show you how to reach this goal. One of the most important things that you need to know that bone resorption is, is the classification of Kawood and Howell. Since most of the cases, the patients that are arriving in our clinics are in level four to six. So you are basically speaking about basal bones. That's why, in, especially in the maxilla, as well as in the mandible, you need to learn how to do it uh, when you have much less alveolar ridge or uh, alveolar bone, since the, this bone, this is the type, type 4, the most common, the triangular type. And trying to put an implant in this area will result in failure sometimes. You need to learn how to make it thicker or higher in cases basically in the mandible. So guided bone regeneration, when the ridge is about seven to eight millimeters or less, the use of guided bone regeneration with collagen membranes and bone can be used. Many bone substitutes can be used. Uh, I'm not gonna speak about all of them. I will talk about a little bit about autograft. They will result in regeneration, while all the other bones, including allograft and xenografts, are mainly scaffolds that promote bone regeneration. The resorbable membranes can be used. We have many in Israel, and I hope, and I think you have also in every other country. So collagen, allodem, PGA, PLA, any of them are good. The horizontal augmentation in the maxilla, xenograft is as good as the, the autograft, and this is also very important since studies have shown that this is exactly the same if you're talking about the results, failure results and success rates. So a bit about barrier membrane, the minimal requirements for implants, we all know it's around one millimeter around the implant. I'm saying much more. 
because one millimeter is, is actually not enough since basically when you're doing extraction, some of the buccal bone will be, uh, will be lost. So if you're planning on one millimeter, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not always the best. And if you want to have a good 100% success rate, you'll need more than one millimeter planning. We are using a titanium membrane, which is important for both vertical and horizontal ridge augmentation. We all know that from the literature that if you just lift the periost from the bone, bone will grow until it reaches the periost again. And it is also, also well known in the sinus. If you're doing sinus lifting without any bone, even though you don't put any bone, but the, you, you leave the membrane upwards, it will cause regeneration of bone until it reaches the membrane again. So current literature, as I said, and the most important part is that when you're using the titanium membrane, you can put simultaneously the implants without the need for secondary surgery. Also very important, you need to know how to do titanium membrane for vertical augmentation, especially in the mandible. And the, the membrane is left for six months. I'm doing it five, sometimes six, depends on the situation. And I will show you cases as much as possible so that you will see the uh, cases and not just speaking about them. So the first case is a female patient of mine. She was 50 years old. She came, I think, from uh, Slovenia. She had a vertical mandibular ridge deficiency. Her treatment was vertical bone augmentation using titanium reinforced barrier membrane and human bone graft and autograft. So this is the starting point. She arrived using, uh, showing like this. So you can see that the amount of bone around here is around, if you're not seeing the, the area of resorption is around uh, six or five millimeters of good bone, and then a demineralized bone. So the total is less than 10 millimeters. And if you want to try to put a, 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 an implant here, the result, and the problem will be that you have a, a ratio of uh, crown to implant, which is not favorable for the implant. So the result will be a higher rate of uh, uh, failure. So even though you can put implants, it's not always wise to put implants anywhere and any, everywhere. So you need to think about the height of the bone also and the, the, the relationship between the crown and the, bone, and the implant. So one-to-one -one ratio is the best ratio, and even higher if it's possible, but not lower. Not, don't have a, a higher crown, which is shorter implant. So this is the membrane that I used. I used it uh, in this situation as well. And after a while, uh, as I said, five to six months, you have around, uh, I'll show you the, the amount. So this is the results. We started between six to five millimeters of good bone and another three millimeters of demineralized bone and finished at 14, sometimes 15, depending on the, on the area that you're looking at. So this is a good uh, example of vertical uh, augmentation. And of course, after that, putting a 13 millimeters implant, that's very easy now. And, in, and the, the ridge is completely restored and the relationship between the implant and the crown is one-to-one -one ratio, which is a good ratio for implant uh, restoration. So this is the before and this is the after. Another thing that is important to learn is the ridge spreading. When you have six to seven millimeters of ridge, spreading can be used. We are using, I'm using osteotomes for ridge spreading that allows uh, uh, to make it much uh, to save as, as much bone as possible. Um, you must not have a vertical defect. This is very important. Otherwise, you won't be able to put uh, the implants. Uh, you, you're putting the implants, of course, at the same time when you're doing the ridge spreading. Uh, I'm doing it a lot in the maxilla. Of course, the mandible is not a good option because it is less malleable. The, the flexibility of the maxilla is much higher. It is a better option if you want to do ridge spreading. Uh, and when you have less than three millimeters of ridge, you should not spread it. This is the contraindication. The, something that is important, you need to know that the palatal bone is much stronger than the buccal expansion, so you must understand that there will be only buccal expansion. The buccal will move and the, the, the palatal will not. When you have a palatal expansion, that means you have a fracture. 
so this is a patient that has a much thinner uh, ridge. What important is when you're doing the, the, the exposure, you do it minimally. So you need to leave this area, the buccal area connected to the bone that you are about to uh, uh, disconnect. Because this bone that will be disconnected, she will receive its uh, blood supply from the buccal area and from the palatal area, which is left connected. So this is very important. This is the, if you disconnect it, you will have a free bone graft and it will fail. So this is the osteotome, you put it where you want it, and then when you spread, you see that the bone is now free, but it's still connected to the buccal area. So you can put the implant without any problem in the middle, and then put the bone, and then you can close everything up. You have a modification of this uh, expansion technique uh, uh, introduced by Mish. Uh, this is the option for a lot of, patient, a lot of uh, surgeons that are doing it in the clinic. So when you have uh, more than three millimeters, but less than uh, seven to eight millimeters, you can use uh, Zakaria or any other type of uh, bore that is uh, not uh, thick enough, not too much uh, thickness, because you can see that you lose around two to three millimeters of uh, bone here when you do the cut. So I don't like this uh, technique, but it's an option if you're doing it on, in a clinic and you don't have osteotomes. And after that, you can use it like a distraction. Since this is a, a, a maxilla, it will bend and it will not break that much. So you can put your osteotome uh, just to change the angle or the, the change the, the way the maxilla is looking. So you, you can leave it outside. And then you can see that the implant is placed and the bone is not exactly broken, but it is a little bit uh, bended. It's bended and this area is broken, but this is okay because when you put the bone around it, you will have a wrap, which is a rapid uh, accelerated uh, changes that happen when you have um, uh, any bone fracture or any surgery on a bone. So then you put uh, your uh, collagen membrane if you need, and you can close it after three months. You can see the thickness of the uh, of the ridge that was resolved in this situation. This is a technique which I, I'm less favorable about because it making uh, uh, you need to expose everything and you, you're losing some kind of bone. I like the better the osteotomes, but it's a good option. Only bone grafting, also a very good uh, gold standard technique for atrophic maxilla. Uh, when the ridge is about four to five millimeters, autografts are advised. First, it was described in 1975 by Brennemark. I'm using a lot of the Ramus and the synthesis blocks that will give enough bone for around four teeth if you're doing a rehabilitation. The advantages for autografts are fast revascularization. Disadvantages, unpredicted absorption. Of course, it's another surgery in a different area, so you have morbidity. And also, when you have severe atrophy, when I'm talking about severe atrophy of the mandible, I'm talking about LU3. LU3 is less than 10 millimeters of bone in the mandible. Mandible. You probably saw some of the people, it's usually little old ladies, uh, lul uh, patients that are coming that they don't have any bone in the mandible, they just have the basal bone that is left, no alveolar bone, and they want uh, uh, something that will give them good quality of life and it will be uh, fixed and not something that is detachable. So if you are encountering this situation, you can have two options. You can use nerve lateralization and only bone grafting, or you can use specifically implants that are 3D printed for this specific patient. I will show you both options, and you can choose for yourself. So if you want to do destruction, you don't have enough bone, guided bone, you don't, you don't have enough bone, titanium membrane, you don't have enough bone. Bone grafting alone, sometimes it's not so good, and or very short implants, also not the good option for this situation. It will all fail eventually. So this is the situation. This is the case, this patient, uh, uh, her name was Rosette. She was, uh, from the age of 16, she didn't have any teeth. So you can see that she's low three. She have around uh, 10 millimeters uh, or less of uh, mandible. All around, you can see that the implants that were originally uh, put lost 
almost 70 to 80 percent of the bone and they are stuck in the basal bone which will last her for a couple of uh, months maybe but then you will have infection and it will be lost also. So in this situation we did lateralizations. First we took a bone from the calvaria. This is the calvarial bone. We split it and then we took out the nerve from the canal. You can see that the nerve is located here in the rubber band. And then you put the bone on the area that you want to put the implants following that. And you can see the panoramic view. This is the bone that was left and then the implants that were placed around three months from the operation. So this is the dental implants that were placed and following that she's now six years following the reconstruction and she's very happy and she can eat the salad. This is what she wanted to do because one of the hardest things that you want to eat is salad. I don't know why but most of the patients really want something strong enough to can have um, fine tuning on small things. So. She was very happy with the situation and she is now, I think it's almost the seventh year now. Another case, this is the male patient, 24 years old, he was healthy, he had a car accident with panfacial trauma, he was on call at the time of the operation, of, of the uh, accident. You can see that his car, he drove off the road into a building and a, and a, and a wall, so he was in between them. Uh, he came to me, all in all, it was two and a half years of rehabilitation. We started from uh, um, first uh, surgical rehabilitation, the oral and maxillofacial rehabilitation, and from there we went to the dental rehabilitation, which included the ilia crest bone grafting for the mandible. Soft tissue also was needed, so we used skin grafts and uh, maxillary only calvarial bone grafting dental implants and of course uh, the PFM, the bridge. I, I did all of the case so I can show you from start to stop, from the beginning to end. So this is the patient when, I, when I'm arriving to the ER, you can see that he has a panfacial trauma, which means that he has a Lefort 2. You can see the disconnection in the area of the nose. This is the Lefort 1, Lefort 2. Uh, zygoma, this is the zygomatic fracture and a big uh, mandibular fracture. So what you see the bone, it's somewhere, but when you open uh, the neck, you don't see anything. When you start, you only encounter with very small parts of bone and you think, okay, so I need now to do like a puzzle. So this is what you do. You take the, the, the lingual bone with the buccal bone and start connecting them and you make a nice puzzle, which is very, I'm very good with puzzles, but the result even though you create all the bones uh, and you put them all together, this is free bone graft. And after a while, you can see that some of the bone is being lost and the soft tissue is not exactly adhering. And you continue and it tells him to wash as much as possible and to clean. And after three months, all of this bone was lost, even though we did a very nice reconstruction, but it is still free bone graft. So all of this bone was lost and he was in, and he was in need of some kind of, uh, of an option. So we took an ilia crest bone grafting. Oh, you can see the connection to the uh, frontal area, the uh, Lefort 2 fracture and the zygomatic fracture. So what we did is first we used the calvarial bone graft for the maxilla. After that we, oh, this is very important. When you're doing only bone grafting, you need the recipient bed preparation. So do some holes, you need to drill to see some blood, and then you can put your calvarial bone graft or your iliac or your ramos or your symphysis, wherever you put, you need first to do some, some holes and then you connect them. So this is the result after uh, the first surgery. So you can see the big plate and you can see all the plates that were connecting all the small bones. All of this bone was lost. So we put a new bone, ilia crest bone graft here and calvaria at the front at the area of the maxilla. So this is the following the ilia crest. This is the ilia crest block and the calvaria I show you, I show you before. Then I, I put I put the alpha bio dental implant in the maxilla as well as in the mandible. You can see the AP, this is the plate, and this is the implant in the, in the mandible and the maxilla. 
And this is the reconstruction, the final reconstruction. He was very happy and he's, I think, now almost six years. It took around two and a half years to finish from start to stop to end. It was very hard for him, but he's very happy now. So another thing that is very important to learn is to, to immediately extract and implant. So when you're doing it, you need to do it and to master it if you want to do total jaws. So immediate extraction and implantation. The oral surgeon needs to start familiarizing himself with this technique. Usually you need to do an atraumatic extraction because you will need the bone for uh, implantation. So immediately placement of dental implants followed by the complete soft tissue coverage. This is very hard to master if you don't see it. So when you're using your soft tissue, you need to do a cut at the periost, at the periosteum. And the cut of the periosteum will allow the soft tissue to become flexible. Because the periosteum is what keeps the soft tissue connected to the bone and doesn't allow you to make it uh, um, flexible. But when you do the cuts of the horizontal cuts, and I will show you pictures so you will understand. So complete coverage of soft tissue is paramount because if you don't, then the result will be a bone that will be lost and implant that will be exposed and also infected. If you don't learn this, you will have a failure of immediately loading complete jaws for sure. So this is the patient that I wanted to show, two cases, a 35-year-old male, he was healthy, he had a, a tooth number 36, a molar, that had periapical radiolucency and bone damage and pain while eating. We extracted the tooth and uh, raising the flap, immediately bone grafting and immediate implantation. You can see the prior city, the city from the beginning, you can see the bone is lost around the distal. Uh, um, it, it had some kind of probably a, a fracture, I don't remember, but I think it was a fractured uh, root around here. We used alpha bio neo implant and alpha bio demineralized bovine bone graft. The operation, first of all, the most important part is atraumatic extraction. You need to know how to extract atraumatically. Of course, you expose and you have a, a vertical cut and everything is exposed and then you can do the extraction. And you need to clean everything and a lot of uh, curatage and then you think, where do I want to put the implant? If you have a good option in the front, in the uh, uh, proximal uh, hole, then it will be better because you can change the angulation here. But I usually don't let the, the, the roots of the teeth guide me. So if you want to put the implant in the middle, that's also okay. So depending on the area where you want to put it. So I chose the front, the uh, mesial uh, hole because it was looking good when you look. You can see that you have enough more than three millimeters from the tooth and it's a good uh, option for reconstruction following that. So you put the implant, you see that the undulation is correct and you see that the, everything looks uh, to your satisfaction. And if you're with a rehabilitation doctor, you see you talk with him and if everything is okay, you can continue with the implantation, you put the bone and then you do the cuts. This is the most important part. You see that the horizontal cuts that you need to do are around here and then the soft tissue will become flexible and you will be able to close it completely. Watertight closure. In this situation, the bone will stay, soft tissue will guide it and you will have a, a complete uh, coverage of also attached gingiva as well as a, a regeneration of bone and the implant will survive. Another option, in this time the maxilla, this is just to show you the vertical cuts and the uh, tooth that we are about to extract. Again, use good tools, try to do it atraumatically. I use uh, luxators, atraumatic extraction of the tooth. It was uh, not functioning. You can see the area. This, this situation, the, the implant can stay in the hole of the of the tooth that was extracted because it looks good enough if you're choosing uh, the right angulation. So this is the preparation. 
This is the drill that was made. I'm using this situation SPI uh, implant 4.2, 13 millimeters long, and you can put, I always use uh, uh, hand tools. We call it buxa because it's much easier to manipulate and you can change the angulation of the implant if you want to uh, implant in different angulations. Uh, in this situation, uh, human bone corticocancellous granules, it's the same anyway. Then after you put the bone, you cover everything up after you close the, the cover screw, of course, and then you do the, the horizontal cuts. This is the most important area, as I said. You can see the blade is inside, and then you could do a horizontal cut until your uh, tweezers is uh, disconnecting. So you can lift the soft tissue and close everything up completely. In this situation, I use a uh, silk. You can use uh, nylon. In my opinion, nylon is better, but my patients don't like it. They feel they, it doesn't feel good in the mouth. So. Silk is also a good option, 3.0, also very good. Another thing that is very important to learn is 3D printing. This is something new also in Israel. Uh, the advances of technology allows us to use uh, specialized 3D printers to print patient-specific implants that can help in rehabilitating complex cases. I'm talking about cases where you have less than five millimeters of bone and conventional implants are not, uh, are not there to help you. So titanium specific implants are printed using 3D laser printers, which shoots a laser beam into a cloud of titanium dust and prints pixel by pixel the desired implant. The implant can be used in cases where less than four millimeters of mandibular bone is present, five to four and or even when the patient is reluctant to undergo sinus augmentation and uh, you want to help him and it's a possibility when you have more than four millimeters so you can do a printed uh, implant you can reach up to two millimeters i think one is not the best option so this is a case of uh, complex uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, AZ, she had the mandibular area in the third quarter that lacked sufficient bone for traditional implant restoration. The maxilla was treated in the standard surgical procedure with bilateral sinus lifting using PRF and PRP bovine bone and mixed with human cortical bone graft for sinus lifting. Uh, the third quarter, as I said, was, uh, so was lacking enough bone, so it was treated using patient-specific implant with 3D laser printer. So this is the situation prior to the operation. We had around three to four millimeters of bone in the upper jaw. Sometimes in this area it was one to two millimeters. And also here, this, this implant was uh, left only for the rehabilitation and it was uh, extracted following that. The implants here, I was not the one that done them, so she didn't want them to be extracted. Some of the implants are not good, but she said she's suffering from financial reasons. She decided uh, to leave it. So this area, she had around three to four millimeters of implant. So we used the patient-specific implant for this area, and I will show you. The planning, then first you need to understand, um, you need to plan where you want to put your implant and then you can print it. This is the printed implant. We have small holes that you can drill to make it uh, more stable. This is the area, the exposed area. First you expose it, you do small vertical cuts. You, do, you drill your holes that will make it more stable. The second stage you put it, then you drill holes in a horizontal uh, manner, then you put bone, in this case putty bone, and you close everything up. In the maxilla, it's more or less of a standard. You have uh, the maxilla, then you do a total uh, jaw, you need to do a total cut. I usually make a small vertical cut in this area to make it two small cuts. Sinus lifting, the traditional way, if you have a tearing of a sinus, then you need some kind of PRF or PRP to make it uh, uh, closed. But anyway, this is the area of the maxilla. This is the bone that was inserted. I use PRF in a mixture with PRP and bone, 
So you have some kind of a patty bone. You can see the PRF, platelet rich fibrin. I use a, a centrifuge of the blood and you take the upper part and you, you need to make it thinner and uh, all the water are coming out and you can use it like a membrane. And this is the PRP and the bone sometimes mixed with some kind of PRF that is cut to small pieces. And all of this is put inside the sinus lifting. We used in this situation ice uh, alpha bio 3.75, 13 millimeters. You see the drilling of the holes from the sinus after the sinus lifting. Then we put the, the implants and the PRF also at the top because the PRF really helps you to um, rehabilitate also the soft tissue. So soft tissue, it has a lot of growth factors in it, so it really helps you when you have uh, uh, tears in the membrane or if you want soft tissue to uh, recover fast. So this is a good uh, thing that you need to have. Um, I can give you a small uh, tip on how to buy a centrifuge. My first centrifuge was from AliExpress. I'm not doing any promotions now, but it was around $100 and, and I began and then I bought something better. But the beginning was something uh, that you all can buy very easily and start uh, doing it. It's just centrifuge for 2,500 RPMs for around 8 to 20 minutes until you see the jello form. And then you close everything up and rehabilitate later on. So total jaw rehabilitation, this is the, the, the thing that you all uh, need to, uh, all of us want to do it. So this is basically when a patient comes without teeth in the upper or lower jaw, the teeth are not as good and he needs to a total rehabilitate with extraction and loading. So up till today, the patients were requested to use temporary prosthesis for six months because of the maxilla prior to the implantation and exposure and loading. Disadvantages of the old techniques are discomfort to the patient. The patients don't like to have um, um, uh, prosthesis because it doesn't really, uh, the taste of the, the, the food is changing, the, the phonetics changes, the lack of sufficient aesthetics in the waiting period the phonetics, as I said, and the taste, and gagging. Sometimes I had a patient who could not put the, the, the posterior in the mouth. It had a lot of gag reflexes. And this is the conventional technique. So this is what we are doing in many of the cases, but I will show you how and what, and then I will show you the new protocol. So this is a 58-year-old male, medical history. He had diabetes mellitus type 2, but it was in a good, uh, uh, I think the A1C was 7.2. Hypertension, cholesterol, upper jaw had dentures that was detachable, and lower jaw had four implants that were not connected to the prosthesis, even though he had like balls, ball attachment, but they were not connected. <coughs> Sorry. So the planning was 10 dental implants in the upper jaw four dental implants in the lower jaw and to use the four implants that were already in place, wait for about six months with the old dentures, and then complete a PFM bridge in upper and lower jaw. The things that you need to check up, diabetes must be below 7 A1C. I know that it's very, uh, sometimes it's not possible, so maximum 8, 8%. If you try 10% A1C, the result will be failure of implants and you'll need to do them all over again. So eight is the maximum. Hypertension must be normalized to surgery. We are using conscious sedation in Israel. And this is the patient when he arrives to the clinic. You can see he has uh, dentures uh, up and lower. You can see the full uh, palate that is uh, covered completely. He's, I don't think it's the best uh, looking dentures, but he was happy with this situation. Without the dentures, he had a loss of vertical dimensions. So the planning, as I said, four implants in the lower jaw, 10 implants in the upper jaw. This is the time after half a month, half a year. This is the exposure of the upper and the exposure of the lower jaw. It was not clean. So everything was... Uh, um, all of the implants were 
exposed. We wait around 7 to 14 days until all of the soft tissue recovers. And then we do the, the, the full PFM. So this is the, you see all the implants are in place. None of them uh, failed. This is the, the PFM, the bridge. And this is the patient with the results. He was very happy with the situation. He didn't have any problems in phonetics and he was very happy because he had his dentures with him and he was using that for many years. But most of the patients, when you give them dentures, they don't really like them. So there is another option which is growing very fast and all of the news and everywhere in Israel and everywhere I think in the world, people are talking about total jaw loading and total jaw rehabilitation. And I will show you a couple of options what is the disadvantage for this technique that I showed you? So it is time consuming, it's less comfortable to the patient. If he doesn't have any dentures before, he won't uh, like them. He has changes in phonetics and mastication. If he needs to eat differently, he's losing some weight. Most of the patients lose around five to 10 kilos. It's not bad, of course, in some situations, but you will gain them for sure. Yes, there, is, there is a risk of uh, implant exposure due to the pressure of the denture and the aesthetics is of course inferior to uh, immediately loading. So the protocol for immediate loading is uh, the time frame is around 10 days from surgery, but this protocol that I'm showing you is maximum 48 hours from surgery. So you need to find a good uh, technician that can make a, a prosthesis in 48 hours maximum. So extraction of the teeth with curettage irrigation and bone grafting. This is what I showed you up till now. This is techniques that you all know how to do. Of course, the extraction should be atraumatic. Uh, if you're not doing uh, sinus lifting and you have enough bone in the frontal area, you can do six to, ten, six to eight implants uh, for acrylic temporal restoration and then um, if you leave it or you can do porcelain after that. But if you're not doing sinus lifting, six to eight, with sinus lifting, 10 implants. And multi-unit adaptation and fixation, uh, 30 to 35 Newton torque, it's very important. Otherwise, your implant is not good for immediately loading. The transfer, also the connection and suturing the tissue using simple interrupted sutures when you connect the, uh, everything and you try to do continuous suturing, the result will be when you take out the transfers, then you won't be able to find the implants and you need to open everything. So very important, use simple interrupted sutures. We will show you cases and you will understand. Impression, vertical dimension, centric, lip, canine, smile, everything you learned in dentistry, you need to do now. When the patient is under anesthesia or you can wake him in this situation, after you finish the surgery and everything is closed, then you can wake him and do the vertical dimension, centric, lip, canine, smile registry, everything that you learn, you need to do now because you don't have enough time for that. And you close the multi-units using the healing cups after 20 to 20 to 48 hours. This is the time after the surgery. So a day from the surgery, the patient is required to visit the technician for occlusion and teeth measurements. He, he, he looks at the, at the result of the impression, if it's correct, if it needs some changes, vertical dimensions was correct. 48 hours from the surgery, the patient comes back to the clinic and the temporary fixed posterior is given and tightened up to 35 newtons and you say goodbye. You meet him after two months and after half a year, you need to make a new one or change it to porcelain, whatever you choose. The occlusion is adjusted to group function and the patient is introduced to eat soft foods gradually and add harder food. This is also very important. Don't start by eating your first steak ever and nuts. So try eating soft food and gradually harder. So make the, the bone around the implant grow faster. Follow up every two months, this is uh, my option, until the end of six months, and then you can choose your uh, rehabilitation option. 
So example, this is a 47 year old healthy female. She was suffering from lack of posterior support and drifting of the anterior maxillary teeth. She had been suffering from periodontitis and caries all her life. The plan was total clearance of all the uh, teeth, eight implants in each jaw, bone grafting and immediate loading of both jaws. The patient wished to avoid sinus lifting, so it was okay because she had enough bone at the front. Uh, in this situation, uh, you should use implants that give you a good uh, grip of bone. So either use uh, SPI or NEO. These are the good implants that have good support and good bone, um, bone support for immediately loading. Trying to use DFI will result in failure because the, the, the thread is very thin, very small, and it doesn't have a good grip at the beginning, so maybe in the, in the mandible, but in the maxilla, much less. So it's very important to know which implant to choose in every situation. So this is the case. This is the patient. She had the loss of bone, periodontitis. Everything was moving. The patient had distal drifting and upper teeth. Uh, she lost, uh, she had a diastema forming. Uh, she refused for sinus lifting. And she had enough bone in this area and this area, so we didn't need to do anything heroic. And immediately, losing was the final treatment. You can see her from the beginning. You can see the implant, the, the bridge, and you can see the diastema that is, has formed. She, she didn't have it at the beginning. And she wasn't happy from the way that the gingiva are looking. It was uh, only discoloration from pig ethnic pigmentation, but she wasn't happy and she wanted uh, some kind of prosthesis that will uh, um, make it disappear. So we did the planning of the uh, prosthesis that everything will be covered up to her smile. So this is my clinic. We started the surgery. This is the patient and she's of course under anesthesia. Extraction, immediate implantation, the multi-unit connection. This is the upper and lower jaw. First important part is extraction, as traumatic as possible. You need the bone, you need the bone. In this situation, you need the bone most importantly because if you lose the bone, you won't be able, you can put an implant, but you won't be able to put an implant for uh, immediately loading. It won't have enough bone support. So the most important part in this situation is you need the bone. You need every bone, every piece of bone. And then you put, you, you drill your holes, you need to drill them, uh, leave the buccal area as much as possible, do it palatally as, as much as possible, palatal as possible. And I use again uh, hand, hand tools. After you put the implants, then you use uh, the upper and lower jaw, and then you put uh, multi units. Multi-units are connected. You can see that the buccal area is left unused because this area will be resolved in most cases. So you need to think about the result in the future, not also in the past. So this is the implants as far as possible. All the implants are placed. Then the uh, transfers are connected to the multi-units and then you close everything up. As I said before, you put the bone and you close simple sutures. This is the bone and then the closure, simple sutures, no, not continuous. Otherwise, when you take this out, you will lose the, the area of the implant. You won't be able to put the cover screw back in. Also, the maxilla, you can see again, the buccal area is left untreated. You don't, you don't want to put the implant buccally because this is not the right angulation. And also, the buccal area will be lost in most cases. And you close everything up with sutures after you put the bone. And this is the cover scores after you finish the situation. This situa in this case, she wanted aesthetic hyaluronic acid injection for the lip and nasolabial fold. Use the stilen for the nasolabial and the lip, only the outline. And, and in the future, she will get the, the body of the, if, of the lip, upper lip only. After a day, 24 hours, uh, she wakes up in the morning, she goes to the technician, he looks at the uh, tooth, 
see that she is planning for her the WhatsApp and the, the, the vertical dimensions and everything is correct according to the uh, um, the way that we took it the day before. So everything is okay. She comes to me after 48 hours and she has the uh, prosthesis uh, connected to her mouth and she she was of course very happy because we gave her a nice uh, uh, nice uh, pink smile without the pigmentation she was not happy with. This is the implant following the surgery. Another example, a 38-year-old female, the medical history, she was suffering from schizophrenia. She was balanced, but this is a situation because uh, sometimes you're not sure that she's, uh, uh, she can understand what she's about to be uh, undertake. So she was suffering for lack of posterior support and dental neglect. She had uh, a lot of caries. Due to sensitivity, we, we again, we thought about it, but at the end we decided to agree and to give her the, the treatment and despite possibility of cooperation issues. The plan was total clearance, eight implants in each jaw, bone grafting and immediate loading of both jaws. The patient wished to avoid sinus lifting, it's coming uh, like a like a plague, everybody wants to not do sinus lifting, so we avoided it. If it's if, sometimes it's possible, we avoid it. In this situation, she had enough bone at the front, like before, so she can have implants around here. Everything was mobile; nothing was left. Uh, even though sometimes you can find one or two tooth that are okay, but most of them were mobile and a lot of caries. Sorry. So we do the extraction as traumatic as possible, put the implants again uh, palatally as possible. You need to think about the buccal bone, do the impression, after you put the transfers and then the cover screws, like before, again, it is mandible. And here, the implants, the multi-units, the transfers. In this situation, these implants were too close together, so we left this implant untreated and only used this one. This is the lower jaw, this is the upper jaw, and the connection, and then the, she comes after two days, you can see a lot of fibrin, she's suffering a little bit, but you can see all the implants are exposed correctly, the suturing was good, everything looks okay, so you can put the prosthesis, you close everything up at 30, 35 newtons, and say goodbye for six months. So this is the implant was, uh, that was not used, and this one was used. And you can see all the implants are at the front, but eight implants and a good result. So the second part is a little bit, I will talk a little bit about complications. Only the common ones are serious infections, bleeding, nerve injuries, and sinus lift complications. Um, infections. The thing that we are most dreading about is necrotizing fortiitis. This can happen only if the patient is given the wrong antibiotics, no uh, curettage or cleaning of the area, and because the face has a lot of uh, holes, like uh, sublingual uh, space, submental, pterygomandibular space, these spaces are potential for uh, life-threatening situations. Um, soft mean Tissue management when you do extraction is paramount in all surgeries. Infection can be sometimes life threatening, not always, but you must always think about it and always perform irrigation, curettage, again irrigation, and complete soft tissue closure. I choose uh, when you have more than one to two to extracted, I choose a higher uh, uh, coverage of antibiotics. So, moxipen is not good when you have a lot of. Uh, and curettage to do, and the tooth are extract more than one tooth, so I use augmentin, amoxicillin, calvolonic acid, if you don't know the word, and chlorocidin, also very important, taudent, corsodil, whatever you have in your country, you need at least one week, I give two weeks also. So this is a patient that came to my clinic with the wrong choice of antibiotics, wrong soft tissue management. This is a male, 49 years old, he was married, he had three children. He had lower jaw, floating teeth with huge amount of granulation and tissue. He was treated by a GP, he was, uh, the GP was a, a friend of mine. 
and uh, he called me and he said, uh, oh, it's were only two teeth that were extracted. There was granulation, but I didn't do anything. I just took the tooth out and sent him away, gave him oxypen instead of mugmentin. A lot of granulation was left. You can see a lot of granulation in the area at the front that was not uh, taken out. Only the tooth were exposed. After two days, the patient had a severe infection of the hematoma and granulation tissue. On the third day, he was admitted to my hospital, to Rambam, and the patient had difficulty breathing and received an emergency trachostomy followed by surgical removal of dead tissue. The diagnosis of necrotizing facilities was established, and the patient was admitted to the ICU. After two weeks, he was discharged from the hospital, but you can see the result. He lost most of his skin at the area all of this was necrotizing facilities. It looks like sand if you are in the surge, uh, surgery. So it's only because the tooth that were left were exposed to infection. More than 400 different types of uh, bacteria are in the mouth. So you need to cover good antibiotics, good cleaning, good curatage. Otherwise, this is an option. Another case, a 27-year-old healthy male, he admitted to the hospital for a dental implant. The implants were exposed to infection, the hematoma was exposed to infection. And the change that you need to understand, if you have a blue coloration of the underlying skin, this is the ominous sign. So if the skin becomes bluish, that means that you might have an infection that is serious. Necrotizing fatality early stages was diagnosed in this situation. The patient received external to and through drainage of the mental area, IV antibiotics, and was admitted to the ICU department and was discharged after one week. This is the area of the hematoma. There was a large hematoma here. You can see the hematoma and the drainage, and you can even see the bluish coloration of the soft tissue. This is the beginning of necrotizing facilities. In his situation, the skin was uh, saved uh, eventually, and he was not uh, in need for plastic uh, surgery. Another situation that can happen is osteomyelitis. Again, this is something that is quite rare, but implants are known to cause it. So this female patient received dental implants at the area of 36-37. Severe infection was noted after a month. The patient was given, again, moxipen. In situations of infection, you need a higher uh, coverage of uh, anaerobes and gum negatives and implants were removed of course the patient will continue to complain of pain and hypoastasia hypoastasia meaning that the situation is serious because the infection is continuing to deteriorate and the bone is lost so biopsy was performed and osteomyelitis was diagnosed she was given uh, HBO also but no result you can see the bone is starting to become and to look like a dead bone and HBO, hyperbaric oxygenation was also given and no, no good result. External drainage was performed, IV augmentin was given, this is the external drainage, again no good result and she continued to deteriorate and deteriorate and at the end we understood that it's like fire and you need to stop it and to cut the fire in order to stop the, the deterioration because she will lose all the bone. So the patient continued and eventually a mandibulectomy was performed. This was the only option to stop the uh, infection from uh, taking out all her jaw. So she just came for uh, dental implants and the result was mandibulectomy. This is not something that should happen and you should know how to deal with uh, uh, infections. Another thing that is important and sometimes life-threatening is bleeding. Uh, it is rare, but only a few reports were found in the literature, and this is the area that is the uh, highest in, uh, in bleeding situations, which is the uh, uh, submental sublingual area. In the majority of life-threatening cases, the area of this the intermental area is also uh, the area of bone grafting harvesting when you take uh, from the symphysis, this is the area to take from. And this is also the area where surgeons don't ask for CT because the mental, between the mentals is the area that is safe if you're talking about uh, dental implants. 
But unfortunately, the concavity, the way the mandible is shaped, is something that you need to see when you're doing CT. And if you don't, then if you have an S-shaped, a very bad S-shaped mandible, and you try to put the implants, the result will be that you will reach the floor of the mouth. So the intermental has potential to be serious and life-threatening uh, due to the shape of the mandible that can result in lingual perforation. In case of perforation, with the sudden increase in swelling, first apply pressure. This is very important. Don't panic. Just put one finger outside, the other finger inside, and just pressure. Just put pressure and continue. After that, seek for emergency room. The surgeon will secure the airway. Usually, perforostomy was will be performed, and then the the result will be um, life life save. So, in this area, maximum of 13 millimeters should be planned. Okay, this is a hemosis. This is something that is not life threatening, and of course, if the patient has a problem with uh, uh, bleeding, these situations you should think about giving him antibiotics for infection. Nobody really wants to be on this uh, news of northern Israeli citizen returned from a routine dental appointment and was rushed to the hospital when he is gasping for air after the dentist had mistakenly injured the major artery. Nerve injuries, I'm not going to talk uh, that much. The, it is something that is quite rare between 0.6 and 36%. A lot of uh, uh, inferior alveolar nerve injuries are found, uh, especially in areas of uh, low 3, where the mandible is very small and you try to put an implant that is too long. Situations that are more serious is nerve lateralization, buccal bone graft, because you will reach and you will see the implant, the, the nerve, if you try to take, harvest the bone. And also uh, uh, the mental area, you will see the mental and in the upper jaw, the sinus lifting in very atrophic maxilla, you will see the infraorbital. This is a patient that received dental implants. You can see that the implants reach the mental area and the area of the uh, canal. Of course, when it comes to us, the first thing you do is take out the implants, uh, administer high-dose steroids, dexamethasone, tapering down for one week, complex B treatment. We give them B1, B6, B12, follow up for nine months until resolution of the anesthesia. The last topic is uh, sinus lift complications. I will try to speak as much as possible. The anatomy, I think everybody knows. What is important is the capacity of the, the sinus is 15 cc. This is the amount. So if you put 15 cc of bone, the result will be infection. This is the amount of uh, perforations that are found. You see between 20 to 40% all of these people are uh, showing you that perforation is something that will happen to you. If you say, I have 100% uh, results uh, without perforation, that's not possible because all of the people that are talking about this from 1999 to 2014 in the literature have reported between 20 to 40% perforation rates. The first perforation that you will encounter is the class one. This is a very easy perforation to deal with, so you just put your PRF or you put your collagen membrane and continue with the sinus lift. If you have a class 2A in this situation, then you need to put the membrane again and you can continue, or you can make this hole larger and then you will make the class 2A into a class 1. You will see the completeness of the hole and then you can put your collagen membrane and continue with the, the sinus lifting. If you have a class three, which means that you don't see the membrane, everything is torn, I would advise you to close everything up and wait for about uh, three to six months and do it again. Sometimes you will encounter uh, enteric compartment septum. In these situations, you can do two separate holes, windows, so you can lift both of them. Don't try to lift one hole, it will cause perforation. And also very importantly is where you're going to put your cut. When you're doing sinus lifting, I would advise you to put the cut uh, palatally as possible and not on the uh, ridge itself, so palatally, because if you have the heat sense, then it will uh, be here and not on the implants or the 
uh, sinus lifting. If you're only doing dental implants, you can put the cut on the surface or again palatally, depending what you like. Infection, the most important situation is oral fistula. This is cases of patients that are suffering from chronic bilateral oral fistulas. And in these situations, when you have it, in this, uh, this is a 72 year old woman, she had the oral fistula after admission of two dental implants. This is the implants that were placed. This is the fistula, the exposure. This is the sinus that is filled with uh, uh, pus. So she was given augmentin. Otrivin is pseudoephedrine to open the mouth, the nose, to make it uh, uh, clean, and uh, then surgical drainage via calvaluc. Fistulectomy and closure of the oral fistula via advancement flap. Use bisha, it's the fat in the area of the seventh uh, uh, molar. And then we treat her for the symptoms until it resolves and no oral fistula is uh, found. And the, the, the most important thing that I want to show you is that the 50, this patient was, came to me in, uh, uh, when I was in uh, Asuta Medical Center and he was uh, suffering from sinus swelling and pollen discharge and he had a huge maxillary sinus lift. I'm talking about 15 cc of bone. You can see that the, the, the size of the, the, the teeth are this thick. Okay, so you can put an implant here of about 30 to 40 millimeters. Okay, so if you put too much bone and you have maximum 15 cc of total uh, sinus, meaning that you have too much, you've put too much, okay? So in this situation, everything will be infected for sure. So also think about the amount of bone that you are putting inside your sinus. So the take-home message for uh, this lecture is uh, the surgeon must learn the basic techniques in alveolar reach rehabilitation in order to be able to perform total jaw rehabilitation, to think about all the complications, and of course, to know how to deal with them. For mandibular rehabilitation, several good options can be utilized. The surgeon needs to familiarize himself with the different surgical rehabilitation options. Vertical reach augmentation is good for small defects. Larger defects need more advanced options such as nerve lateralization, only bone grafting, or 3D printing, as I showed you before. Implant survival in augmented bone is equal to native bone, and the autografts have high resorption rate, but are the best for integration. So thank you very much all for listening. And if you have any questions, Okay, so there were a question. Um, what do I think about the verso drills? So I really like them, and I'm using them a lot. And I'm not showing them because uh, time, but they are very good, and I really like them. And uh, I know that some people uh, trying to to use old drills and drill backwards, but I use the Versa original and it's a very good option, especially if you're trying to do ridge spreading, you can do any ridge spreading and also close the sinus lifting with these type of uh, uh, drills, but you need to know how to do it. So you have a little bit of a uh, uh, curve for learning, but it's a very good option and I'm, I didn't speak about it, but I use it a lot. Another question. No. Okay. So thank you very much for uh, coming and listening, and uh, I hope you enjoyed, and uh, good luck to you all, wherever you are. Thank you.